So Scott, first question. Do you ever regret not being a paleontologist? Not at all. When I was, I believe in eighth grade, I had always been kind of thinking, well, if the cartooning doesn't work out, I'm a smart kid, at least I'm interested in this stuff. I was in a program where all the kids were really smart. So I figured I better to stand out, really embrace lowbrow stuff anyway. But I thought, well, I still like this. And my teacher t took me aside. He was my English teacher, I think. And he pulled me aside and he says, I know you have an interest in that, but believe me, there are not many jobs for curators and there's no money for exploration in the Gobi Desert. You will wind up working for a petroleum company where the, first of all, the oil deposits are, are from prehistoric uh, plant life, not dinosaurs or bones. <laughs> right. So it's like, it's like that, you know, yeah, I'd like, the, like the, the foliage back then too, but it was really the animals that I was interested in. <laughs> um, Besides the Flintstones made it all come together. Yeah, that's right. Um, tell me about your parents. What did they do for a living? My dad was a Pearl Harbor survivor. Uh, both of them lived in uh, uh, central Illinois. That's where they grew up. But they never knew each other until after he, the war was over. Um, but I have definite uh, feeling that my dad was interested in cartooning. Hmm. He, when I was very young, he gave me a speedball pen set. There was ink everywhere, but he and he showed me how to draw things. And when he was stationed away from home a little bit. He would do paint by number sets mm -hmm. and make very, uh, you know, detailed Christmas ornaments to put up on the top of the house, big displays. It never once occurred to me that, gee, maybe my dad likes art too, because I figured, well, yeah, he's my dad, he can do anything, you know. Mm -hmm. um, after he died, it turned out that some of his buddies came out to tell me, well, didn't you know your dad liked to draw too? Mm -hmm. And with the speedball thing, I have a feeling that he just figured if I sign up for a couple of years, see the world, I'll come home, I'll be a sign painter. Mm -hmm. He never told me that. Mm -hmm. He wound up becoming a lieutenant commander. Mm -hmm. And uh, when he retired, he became a night watchman at the San Diego Zoo and wound up as the head of security there. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got a job at the zoo as mm -hmm. a trash man when I was in college. Mm -hmm. What was San Diego like back there, back then? Well, when you're... When you're a white kid and your dad's a Navy officer, it's a pretty easy life. Mm. Um, I spent a lot of time, uh, you know, the, the movies on the bases were a dime. Mm -hmm. uh, I could go and buy comics. There was usually all these recruits and I have to push them aside so I could get the comics. Then when I'm like 16 and I'm still a dependent, I'm like complaining that, that you know, <laughs> that's fine at the base, but if I go to a comic shop, there's all these damn kids in front of me. So it all flipped over. How supportive were your parents regarding your art and your career choice? I was, I was very lucky. My, uh, as I said, my mom didn't quite get me. I think my dad got me a lot more. He would call, when I got bad grades, he would refer, this is so old school, he'd call it foolishness, <laughs> which sounds like I'm like an Amish guy or something. <laughs> but. But I think he just was worried that, they both were worried that I was gonna get into a business where I just, as Jonathan Winters once told me, I was, my parents were scared I'd fi they'd find me in the, in the gutter drinking ink. <laughs> um, but, you know, ultimately, uh, you know, I, I never got any art classes in school because of my testing, unfortunately. But they would let me take like summer school art classes occasionally or classes at the zoo or at the national at the uh, natural history museum and stuff like that. There was a point where I was, you know, drawing for the the school paper in junior high school. So, you know, I think they knew I was taking it seriously at least. And my dad, who was had been in the Navy long enough to know how to work the system, so he wasn't being moved around. He was, mm -hmm. so they had like I think eight or nine bases that were active at mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. So he, between that and 
being a Pearl Harbor survivor, I think he had the clout to say, well, I'd like to work over there. That's closer. Yeah. I want to work over there. That's close to where I like. So he, on the, he, we had weekends. So he would drive me all over San Diego. And I'll tell you, one of the biggest things that really, in fact, I'm doing a drawing on today or the picture on my intro, a lot of the houses that had the most comics were the poorest people. And I'd go in and I had, you know, a lot, lot of kids close to the border. And growing up in San Diego, that was a great place to, like, ner be friends with kids of all backgrounds. Mm -hmm. I didn't know too many black kids when I was growing up. But I knew lots of Latino kids and Asian kids. And um, it, was, it was very, you know, I was pretty lucky due to my dad's status. We were kind of upper middle class. Mm -hmm. And... Some of these people's homes didn't have floors. There was dirt inside the house. And yet they had big piles of comics. And it made me realize, first of all, this is the cheapest entertainment they can get. Yeah. And secondly, I am lucky as hell. And, you know, it was, and because we all had something in common, I didn't feel like I was looking down on them, but I felt kind of guilty buying the comics from them. But mm -hmm. my dad said, well, they wouldn't be answering if they didn't want the money. <laughs> so I thought, well, yeah, hopefully. <laughs> I thought as a kid, I thought, well, maybe they're just wanting to buy more comics like me. <laughs> Probably not. Maybe milk, you know. Tell me about those early inspirations, the, the things that you really gravitated to. Um, what, were the, what was the entertainment, the comics, the animation, whatever, that you were really um, inspired by? As well, and as, you, and as you grew up. Co comics were probably the first big deal. Of course, I was watching TV, but by the, at that time when I was a kid, it was like Farmer Alfalfa. I mean, it was just you know a lot of the really crudest early stuff, which I was found fine. For me, it was the advent of new cartoons for TV. As much as I loved the Warner Brothers and Popeyes and Tom and Jerry's, I'd memorized them all. Mm -hmm. And when Jay Ward and Hanna Barbera started coming out, it was like that you know <laughs> hallelujah you know finally stuff that is from my generation it was very much like Nickelodeon uh, you know especially because Hanna-Barbera had like multiple shows out at any given time but the, when I realized how much I love comics I'd already kind of taught myself how to read before I was five and um, because comics you know Pic they, they, pictures and, and the words a smart kid is going to build it's like a code you figure it out very easily because you've got help yeah. but uh, when I went in the hospital for me for uh, mom, measles not measles um, uh, uh, tonsils taken awesome. out they oh we'll give you all the ice cream I can get ice cream and I'm a fat kid I get plenty of that but all the comics and and it was like the, and I've talked to other people my age that back in the 50s where it was like an in you had to be a patient mm -hmm. that's kind of where a lot of us realized oh this kind of lets us step out of ourselves. I was an only child surrounded by strange kids I really didn't know how to talk to a lot of them and uh, and yet my dad remember my dad brought me to me now I remember it as being like this tall stack it was probably that stack mm -hmm. but still I still remember specific comics in that batch wow. and um, one of them I bought recently, and as I'm reading it, I could I realized I was anticipating what the next word was. Mm. I thought, holy! And it wasn't a kitty comic; it was a Superboy comic, mm. which really didn't write down to kids as much. Mm. So I thought I really was reading at that point because why would I remember this so much? It was the first time I'd seen it in years. Mm. But the first big influences were Dr. Seuss. I didn't know he lived in San Diego, but it was, to, to me, that was exactly the kind of drawing I liked. Mm. And um, comic books, uh, I, I read a lot of funny animal comics. I particularly like Carl Bark stuff and Sheldon Mayer's stuff. Didn't Frazetta do some too, like early, early? In that, the that, was, that was probably earlier than I was reading yeah. comics, and, and my parents tended to buy me you know the mainstream type stuff those were for more like kind of obscure companies I think yeah. but yeah the, I think I, you know the bark stuff especially really impressed me yeah. and I remember 
I, I felt bad about it, so I, I, I went back and told the dentist, but I actually stole a copy of Comics and Stories because those are serialized Mickey Mouse stories, and I missed one. I think my subscription lapsed. Mm. And I went and I, 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 I walked out with the comic because I couldn't stand <laughs> not being able to know what would happen. Um, tell me about your, your love of the Flintstones. What, what is it about the Flintstones that really speaks to you? Well, I already liked Hanna-Barbera stuff a lot. Mm -hmm. And Hanna-Barbera really promoted the fact that we're going to bring this cartoon out you know, like in, in, the, in the early summer, I think it was 1960. So first of all, I'm going, it's my favorite studio. It's about my favorite thing. The main character looks like my dad. I can't wait. And meanwhile, I had music lessons the night it was going to be on. My parents, you know, and again, trying to expose me all these different things. At one point, I was taking violin lessons, and another time, it was accordion lessons. Nothing that's going to get you laid. <laughs> so, I mean, I mean, I'm nine years old, but I'm still a nine-year-old. Even less has anything to do with that. I went on a campaign saying, I've got to stay up. I've got to be able to see this. I can't take those lessons. Uh, years later, I'd, I'd taunt them saying, so are, are, are you, you know, when I'm producing at Hanna-Barbera, are you sorry I, I'm not really a famous accordion player? And they go, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, the, the fact that it was so reliant on dinosaurs and the whole concept of the gags where everything is a prehistoric version of a modern appliance and I mean, some of the logic didn't make sense. I mean, how is that TV working? But overall, it was the, and, and looking back when I was doing them professionally, the thing I liked the most is the organic design of everything. When I'm working on the Flintstones and I haven't in a while, you don't need a ruler. Mm. You, oh, you have a, you want, you don't want a couch? Okay, well figure out how to make it out of some rocks mm -hmm. and make it interesting. And of course, uh, you know, then t when I when I wound up doing the ads for a long time, I'll never forget. I got kind of given a lot of shit for liking dinosaurs. Believe it or not, hmm. talk about getting you laid. Now dinosaurs are cool, but back then, knowing the names got me beaten up occasionally. Oh. Or the girls would go, <laughs> and I go, I say, you know the name hippopotamus. That's a silly name too. Does anybody laugh at that? No. Well, I was at one of the last pebble spots I did. And I thought, well, it, it, was, it took place at a quarry. So I thought, well, I'm going to use some real dinosaurs. Kids like that. Mm -hmm. Now all kids know all the species, right? They know more than me. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, okay, here's a, here's a Carithosaurus, and here's a so-and-so, uh, and -so, and I'm pointing out what they are. And it was female executives from Post Serials, and they're going, <laughs> and I almost turned into the Hulk. I had to really, like, no. No, no, you're going to, you're going to, you're, they're not going to get it and you're going to be branded as a maniac the rest yeah. of your life. Yeah. That's funny. Um, tell me about working, what was it like working for Bill and Joe, you know, Hanna-Barbera versus like Tex Avery? Did, did you work for Tex Avery? Well, I worked with Tex oh, at Hanna-Barbera. Oh, it was with, okay. So yeah, so, about, so, so, so both Tex and I were working for the same guy. Tell me about him <laughs> and, and that kind of personality versus the, the guy. Bill and Joe were, were, were very much, not, not exactly, but, you know, like, like certain other big shots in comics, lovable, lovable rogues. You know, they, Bill, Bill would, was always trying to cut down the costs on everything. Joe was as Hollywood as you could get. Bill was as a typical cartoonist type. But um, when I worked with him, I was scared to death of both of them initially and just moderately scared of them by the time I wasn't working for them because, you know, these were my heroes. Yeah. And I never asked for photos with them. I never asked to sign anything with them. And now I could kick myself because I would love to have those, mem those, those to look at. Mm -hmm. But to me, it wasn't professional. Right. And I... As it was, I, f I, kind I found out they always, in fact, most of the people, the old timers at H&B would kind of roll their eyes because they couldn't figure out why I was so happy to be working there. Mm. And I was always asking them questions about, you know, did you do this? 
things. Why'd you do that? Why'd you, why'd you start filling in Barney's eyes? That sort of thing. So, um, I think I was kind of considered kind of nutty to them too, but they did know I was very loyal to the studio, even though I was more or less kind of disappointed with the material we were doing. Um, but they definitely treated me better than any, than you would have ever expected. And what was Tex like? Tex was in a very bad part of his life. We didn't know it at the time, but Bill and Joe hired him because this is in books now. I don't feel like it's gossip. Tex's adult son had committed suicide and Tex was drinking real hard. And, and he was the one guy of all those guys back from the golden age, even an egotist like Chuck Jones, they all respected Tex. They knew he was the best of all of them. There was never any kind of a argument about that, no matter who you talk to. So they wanted to help him out. In fact, that was really especially, especially Bill. He didn't want to see any of the old timers out of work. That's why they did so many shows. They want, he really was, you know, people got laid off, but he was really good about trying to get the people that, that showed him loyalty. He, they, they were the only two studio bosses that ever showed loyalty to me. Mm. And, uh, so Tex was not doing great, but they gave him some projects and, uh, then Iwo Takamoto, the studio's art director, tried to change them, and Tex just about lose, lost it and went to Bill and Joe, and suddenly Iwo was not in the process. Mm -hmm. So he had that kind of clout. He wasn't, he wasn't being mean, but, but he drew a, a little character that was really unique, and then Iwo went in and made him look like Scooby-Doo. Mm -hmm. So you can see why yeah. Tex, Tex's dander was up. The, the weirdest thing about the whole thing with Tex at H&B was he had this character called Quickie Koala, that was a show and it was a story about uh, the quickie and the the big bad wolf and at the end he used footage of an a-bomb explosion black and white as he did back in his car in his shorts yeah a cbs said no way are we airing that they started with the second ep episode tex died suddenly it goes on the air with a title card that says a Tex Avery classic. Hmm. And so the big joke around the studio for a long time was if you want to get your gag through, just die. Yeah. Hmm. Isn't that sad? Yeah. Uh, do you have any run-ins with Alex Tove, one of my favorites? I, well, was he at Hanna-Barbera? Oh, he, was, he definitely he was at when I started there. Sheets. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, those. well, I mean, I'd go in and talk to him and he was pretty pleasant and, you know, we really didn't do the same thing, but I, I, you know, told him how much I liked the stuff he did for drag cartoons and that mm -hmm. stuff and, uh, got along pretty well. And then one day we're walking down the hall and I see him, we're walking, you know, past each other. I think, good morning, Alex. And he looks at me, huh, Scott Shaw he puts his face. So it's like, you know, like everybody else, I got the toast treatment. Yeah. So he was just kind of. Not manic, but just almost bipolar as far as... Like oh, I way, think he was bipolar. The way he kind of like... Him too. Yeah, because no matter how close you were to him, sooner or later, he'd burn you. Hmm. Brilliant, though, artist. Oh, as yeah. Far as, as far as just... Uh, the way, putting the camera places, I mean, just... My when, Alex, when Alex was working on superheroes and model sheets for Hanna-Barbera, yeah. the biggest problem was the subtlety of his drawing he wasn't obvious where the joints were mm. unless it was a superhero but if it had anybody like the scooby-doo character well he didn't design he designed the monsters mainly but you know what i'm talking yeah. about the average animator had to really know their anatomy to follow it yeah. so it really depends on who's animating it because he wasn't there were there were no um I don't remember him ever doing like a like just a, a construction drawing of anything. He just did the drawing and maybe an explanation, and then on the same page a vehicle and buildings and everything. I mean, those model sheets of his gave you more information, but you had to be an artist almost as good as him to make it work. Oh. I mean, all those cartoons that he designed on Pretty in the mid '60s years. with all this from Space Ghost on for a couple of years, those shows were written for, you know, four-year-olds. 
But I watched them all with a pad of paper sitting in front of me because I thought, even Scooby-Doo, which, which really let me down. It was like, well, so much for Hanna-Barbera. But looking at those, even the monster stuff, that gave me ideas for my own drawings. <laughs> Some of these are really weird. Let me find a good one here. Well, here's the one so with... these are all Bristol board, right? Just kind of... Yeah. And you're, look, that doesn't look like... 11 by 17. No, no, uh, this is no. Or whatever yeah, this like. is this is for uh, for first world peer on, online. Oh, okay. It's going. It's for um, Aces Weekly, mm. which is the thing that uh, David Lloyd does. So you blue line everything. Yep. Like old school, and then what are you using to ink? You, oh, you're using carbon ink. I use this too. Well, I yeah, ink. but I I love this. Ink. I'm getting it's back into brilliant. using pens like that. Like I've been. Oh, you're I've, I've been. Yeah, but I, I, I have a lot more control with these Cove with the, these, these uh, Copic multi Copic, yeah, yeah, yeah. The tech pen. I get a th I get a thick and thin, thin line. Years ago, I was using pen or, or brushes, brushes, and I was really good. But I, I kind of stopped doing it. But when I stopped doing a lot of funny animal stuff, because I realized yeah. it does look good, but it's it's brushes really messy. So brushes are messy. They look really good. I like brushes more than crow quills, like the the, the nibs. Those yeah. are a pain in the ass. Because I spring them wrong or they'll get all gnarly <laughs> and yeah. it's like i got splatter everywhere let me, let me um, find you a couple more here this is a good one where yeah. where they're in a oh, yeah. they 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 so sued is, they sued walmart is, and got a lot of money but their is, house is infested this isn't with a, a tech pen right there that's a that's a you're using one of these little like fountain pen right the flexi no huh no that's all that's really? all yeah oh wow huh i dig it and are you scanning them? Okay, you got your little scanner there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and uh, Jim J Jim McCory is lettering it for me, and Mike Cazala is inking it for me. Here's some of my, here's some of my kids my stuff I do did for a new kids book. This is stuff that I actually get paid for. I'm doing another That's one. That's good. That's always good. And I and so is do you ever have to send originals or are you just scans? I send scans, but uh, the. Uh, the guy behind all this stuff actually he i had years ago i had he had given me money to move be, and i gave him that dr seuss original as you know oh. i'd pay him back on it i owed him nine thousand dollars i told him i said well you know i showed him the illustrator's guide i said no no deal was made before where we have the original so i have to sell them to you and he goes how about just a trade for the nine thousand dollars, and you get the Seuss back. And I thought, I have to say this to you. I wouldn't say it to him, but with all the characters I've worked on, this is the last stuff anybody's going to buy because they don't know who the fuck they are. Matt, Matt, uh, or Matt, not not Matt, Nat, Ger Nat Gertler's uh, oh, yeah. doing a book of my he early is. stuff. So this is a little I addition know, to the, the cover. Um, oh, what's it, peanuts or what is he? He does a lot of oh, peanuts uh, yeah, stuff yeah, that Schultz yeah. did. Um, new stuff. Oh, here, this is kind of fun. I've been, I've been. Oh, here's the Svenguli shirt I did. You know who Svenguli I'm, is? He's a horror has, host yeah. on TV. Yeah, they had. I'm this impressed how clean this is. Like, I have all kinds of stuff on the borders because I'm scanning it, so I don't really care. You keep it very clean. You don't fart around. You do have a couple white out yeah, stuff here, yeah. but I mean, you're, you're. Very clean. Well, I'll tell you, it's it's very anal, I suppose. But if if I was working digitally, yeah. nobody wants but files. We don't have a lot of. Uh, I don't have any investments other than my comic collection. My son Judy can make money off of that when I'm gone. But they can also sell this stuff. They can't sell. They can't sell yeah. a scan. <laughs> right. Yeah. No. Yeah. I I just did these for abandoned San Diego. Oh. oh. Cool. Uh, oh, and this was a thing I did for the that uh, see you in San Diego as a promotional yeah, thing. Yeah. I'm going to do a tighter version of this and make it into a print. I like that. Very but cool. uh, this band is a drag band in San Diego hmm. called the Spice Pistols. So uh, this is the front and back of their CD, That's and then cool. and then I got to do caricatures like of them. And That's cool. I mean. This was this was a lot of fun. I yeah, gotta no, say, and I got to do it. Now, did they give you some 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 photos, photos to work from? Okay, yeah, they gave you some photos. And, and already they, in doing this, they've had three different drummers. So here's the okay. third drummer <laughs> I just did the other day. It keeps that's cool. This is a better looking drummer though. So there you go. Yeah. But um, yeah, this is 
Oh, this is that. Uh, this is that place, man. I told you about. That's nice. Yeah, yeah but it's a coffee shop. I don't yeah, know what it is. yeah. Is it here in the valley? Yeah. Oh. That's cute. That's yeah. very cute. The faces are great. Yeah, but you can see what I mean. This is good. This is like yeah. I think twice up. It's like yeah. you're not gonna know what background yeah, yeah, these yeah. kids have. Yeah, I think she's got an afro <laughs> that's close to getting. And okay. and here are some pages from the Oddball Comics book. Yeah, nine panel grid. I love it. I love nine it. Panel grid's my favorite. You get the most information on yep. a page. Yep. Steve Ditko taught me that. Four Emmys for Muppet Babies. Now let me tell you. I loved Muppet Babies as a kid. I thought Muppet Babies, and even now, Muppet Babies is a brilliant story. It's good. It's not little kids. I mean, it's like well thought out. You can tell, you know, the certain cartoons, you're like, okay, an adult made these. You know, you can tell that there's like craftsmanship involved. Tell me about your experience with Muppet Babies. I think it's brilliant. I, I appreciate that very much because I hear that a lot from people that grew up on it <laughs> because we didn't want to make it like all the shows that imitated it where there's good kids and bad kids the kids are at cross purposes for the first point secondly the reason that show's so good if jim henson liked it cbs didn't say a thing standards and practices were very little men you know playing around with stuff they 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 kind of if, if, if this works great and the storyboard people such as myself I also was the head of the model department but um, we were allowed if we had a better gag let's go with it mm -hmm. and uh, having the rights um, to the to the footage most of that was just on a handshake mm -hmm. I don't think there's ever been an official release of all the Muppet Baby shows you can only get them uh, I'm pretty sure you can only get them, you know, under the under the counter. But um, uh, I did a I did the first Star Wars one using footage. Um, the first boat Ghostbusters one. I did uh, I did a pie fight with Fozzie and the Three Stooges, mm. which was really good. But um, Wait, hang on, I gotta I want to make sure I understand this. So the footage when they actually use real footage of film. Uh, there's no kind of like lawyer getting rights and making sure that everything's back fine. then. I mean, or it was, was just like, yeah, because but they're not all under the same company, right? No, they but 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 Fox. but but everybody liked Henson and Spielberg. Oh, well, yeah, and George Lucas, yeah, sure, we all work together. I mean, I'm I never right. worked in the de in the legal right. department, right. but this is what I understand, yeah, because I mean, we we went wild with it. I actually um, wrote an episode where somebody in the studio thought we had the rights to Flash Gordon, even because they were doing that uh, Defenders of the, of, of the Universe or the whatever it was, mm -hmm. Defenders of Earth, mm -hmm. and they used the, the King Features characters. It turned out they didn't have the rights to use the, the, uh, the serial from the 30s, mm -hmm. and that's what they wrote it to. So the producer, who was a great producer, he 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 let good ideas come from anybody on the on the crew. You didn't have to be an official writer. He asked me, "You want to write this?" He goes, "Here's um, the one that Gene Autry's uh, Radio Ranch, and it was a serial that had like robots with cowboy hats on and stuff." I said, "This is much better than the the Flash Gordon stuff." So I got to wing it on that, and and somebody did a polish on my script. But I mean, it was really fun to do. That whole show was fun to do. I almost felt like I was working on those old shorts because I did a lot of the song sequences and I always huddle with somebody else. We do that. It's like just trying to get things going, you know, because all we'd have is a song mm. and we had to come up with the theme. Yeah. So it's so nice to hear that people realize that we were trying to do something that wasn't just the same old crap. No, and it's, qu it's quality. And I'll tell you, it's our so producer, good. Bob, Bob Richardson, he lost a lot of hair going to management and explaining why we can't ship this yet because we're still doing this or that because the quality was really important. Yeah. Uh, we, we had to do a real rush job on a second series called Little Muppet Monsters. And we did 17 half hours and only three of them ever aired. You can find them on YouTube because Henson hated the look of them. They, they were half-baked because we really didn't even have time to develop them. And I wound up working on a lot of those, too.
what was his involvement like? Did he just get like a final look at it, or what? what how, how much was he involved in that show? He was involved to a certain degree. I don't think he saw everything. Yeah. There was a fellow that worked for him, and I can't think of his last name, but he could draw in a very Muppety style and did a lot of the books for him. Michael, I can't think what his name was. Mm. But he was kind of his second, his, his, his guy to, to take care of these things. Mm -hmm. But I do know that he did oversee stuff to a certain degree. How has... How has the industry changed? What does the industry need right now? Well, first of all, when I go into a comic shop, it's like going into white noise. It's mm -hmm. like I'm being <laughs> tortured somehow because it's all coming through, but nothing's landing. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of hard for me to react to that. There's not very much stuff in out there that appeals me, but I'm not the audience. I'm 71 years old, mm -hmm. and I've read probably... 200,000 comics in my life so there you go I'm, I'm probably a little tired of it but I I'm kind of interested in the fact that all the humor stuff which obviously is my career has uh, transferred to kids graphic novels and that's where I want to put some uh, attention I've got a, a at least an outline for one that I want to pitch after I have all these other projects done, if I'm still alive. But that's really kind of where I belong now. Mm -hmm. But um, in general, comic books, uh, mainstream comics, uh, I have to keep reminding myself these were all, these. most of these are drawn and written by people who grew up in the 90s reading comics, which is the lowest dip in my, I mean, there was good stuff, but not much. I mean, I, I'm always shocked at how amateurish some of that stuff looked. And, uh, you know, I'm not blaming them, but those are the people that are inspiring them. Uh, I was lucky enough to be inspired by guys that really knew, and women, that knew really knew what they were doing and had already been doing it for a long time. So that makes a difference for me, at least, I guess. But, you know, the, 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 the companies are marketing themselves to death. Uh, it used to be that Marvel was the company that would flood the stands and try to, uh, you know, take advantage of whatever the latest fad was. Now both Marvel and DC and Dark Horse and everybody else is trying to flood the stands with as many titles. And I understand now if you're selling 10,000 copies, you're doing well, which is the th I got in trouble uh, a few years ago for saying this, but I'll say it again. If you have the money to, uh, to uh, get a, a license for characters and then turn around and ask the people to write and draw it, oh, we're paying you $40 for the whole thing, that, there's something wrong with that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know who's making money from that because nobody is. Um, yeah. You're referring to some of these companies like uh, Boom or somebody who who buys uh, Star Wars license or Gremlins or whatever and then pays a couple of guys to make a Gremlins series and they're not getting no money because it all went to the buying the Gremlins. Exactly, IP or exactly. Whatever, right? I worked I did I recently did a whole bunch of annoying orange stories. But, you know, I mean, let's face it, that's not like a big big product and I was getting terrible terrible rates, but at least I worked with a a, an editor that was nice to me and didn't want me to pick pick to death. He kind of right. said, "He said, you know the show. I don't. Whatever you want to do, as long as you're not showing any Nazis, just do it." You know. Yeah. Um. What would you? What advice would you give to somebody who's struggling, struggling in their career? You know, struggling with getting seen. You know, again, going back to my comment with about WonderCon. Um, there is a deluge of books of, of people making stuff but you have to wade through so much in my opinion subpar stuff to find good things and maybe you do have a great book but it's just so hard being seen because th there's a th there's waves of junk you know try to be genuine try to create a style that stands out that's not trying that is a natural style for you I think the biggest thing is 
make it appealing in a way that nobody else is making appealing. Don't make it look like your favorite uh, manga character because they already are out there and people are already buying that. Come up with something that's original. Come up with something that's entirely out of your own head and understand that you're going to have to market yourself, but really don't overdo it. Let the, let the work do it. Let the work speak for itself. There is a, um, a tendency, I feel like, for creatives. I've asked a lot of people this because I'm, I'm struggling with this idea too. How does a creative stay current? How do they not age themselves out? Because the market is getting younger, younger. We're getting older. We're getting less in touch with those who are the potential customers, readers. How do you, how do you stay current? Or, or is it a young man's game, and that at some point you just you can't relate? I, I buy, I buy kids' graphic novels. I buy, I buy modern comics. I, you know, just to learn them. I watch TV shows. I um, have Nickelodeon sometimes, but you know, that's just mainly for examining it and kind of figuring out what they're doing. I was just talking to somebody the other day. They were uh, talking about about racial portrayals in cartoons, and I was telling them I've been watching this show called Craig of the Creek, which is on Cartoon Network, and they're very cartoony characters, but. I've been noticing, like on all these CG uh, kid shows, the characters all look the same. Maybe, excuse me, they add a little bit of something to, to, to add their, you know, show their race or their age. But for the most part, it's kind of candy cutter type stuff. This show has mo kids of all types, but a lot of black kids, including all the stars. And they've come up with something where they're almost J. Ward simple. And yet, all the kids look different. They look like kids you've seen or kids you know. And they're exaggerated like a cartoon, but not in the traditionally offensive way. And I recently did like a, a placemat for a, a restaurant that we like. And they said, well, make sure that it's a coloring, coloring place. Well, well, make sure that it's, it's diverse. I said, you know what? They're all about this big. I said, if I make that obvious, then it's going to be offensive. And besides, the kids are the ones that are going to decide. They're, they, they're the ones with the colors. So I did have kids that were obviously black or, you know, but it was, or Latino, but to me it was obvious, you know, the way the hair was done, the way a nose might be done. But you can't overdo anything, especially when it's tiny, because it's like, it's, it's not, a, we're not, nobody's paying us for a caricature here, folks. You know, and nobody represents everybody. Yeah. I'm looking at all these books, and I just, I'm going to just slightly switch the tone of well, this. Because well, if there's an ex if, if there's an earthquake, I, these are all wedged in here that'll probably just stay right there. Um, you've got a lot of amazing books here. Give me your, okay, there's an earthquake. You and your wife got to get out of Dodge. You only get to bring a couple. You get to bring one or two books. What are you taking? Right here is a book on Gilbert Shelton. Okay, you're bringing that. That's yeah, your favorite book. If I could, if I could pull it out in time. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> and then, and then, um, I don't know, probably something by Jack Kirby. They're my two favorites. They're they're my you two big ends. They're the two guys in it, and they're like at the ends, different ends of the spectrum. But I've swiped stuff from like, both of them. Commandi, like what what Jack Kirby are you into? I I love the I love the earliest uh, Marvel stuff, okay. and I especially love those two or three stories he did for Not Brandeck. He did parodies of the Fantastic Four and um, Thor and some of the other characters for it. And that's when I went, you know, I always liked humor and I always liked superhero stuff yeah. too. But I never realized some guys can do both. Yeah. And when I saw that when I was like, I don't know, 66, I was probably in 10th grade. It completely blew my mind. Yeah. And the first time I met Jack, I was like. I told him, I said, you know, I always liked your stuff, but when I saw you could do funny stuff, that's when you became my all-time favorite. And he kind of looked at me like I was nuts. But tell, tell me about him. I feel his style is it's so geometric, and yet it's so also dynamic, and he's just a lot of angles, the way the camera is, and the, the, the warped, you know, frames and, and, and figures. Tell me about him, like... 
he was a he was a fairly short guy, very quiet. Well, not real quiet, but I mean, he wasn't wacky, but he had a great sense of humor. He um, he was so intelligent that sometimes we were worried that he might be starting to have dementia. But he always talked this way. He would kind of make leaps in logic, like his brain was filling it in, but he wasn't letting us know. And uh, incredibly encouraging, um, put up with me in ways that one of my most notorious things was he told me once he said that he liked underground comics. So I assume, okay, well, then you're all in for it. Yeah. I didn't realize he liked underground comics before. There was no there was no house style, and everybody owned their own stuff. Mm. He didn't tell me that. I come in, not, not with an original drawing, but a printed poster of me taking one of his old pre-hero monster stories where this big monster is going, no human can beat me, and he's in this pose. And I just kind of copy the whole thing, except I give him a schlong that looks like S. Clay Wilson drew it, erect. Mm -hmm. And um, no human can beat me off. And at the bottom it says, for Jack Kirby. Oh and he and I bring it to him. I'm going, here you go, Jack, thinking he's going to love it. And he's like, it, 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 the look on his face, it was just like... And he'd already made me into a character in Jimmy Olsen, and here I'm treating him this way, but I'm thinking, hey, he's going to love this. Yeah. And he's going... Uh, I, I've got a family, you know, and I said, I remember I said, I'm so naive. I said, well, maybe you could put it up in a closet. I mean, why would I say that? But, <laughs> but, but anyway, he, he, they, you know, if somebody did that with me, I wouldn't know what to do. Well, I would do now. I mean, it's, I did it, so it wouldn't bother me. But, but the fact that they still had me coming over to their house and we had dinner with them. And, you know, when they go, one day he goes, he goes, Scott, you, we were worried about you, but now you're singing with a choir. And I said, singing with a choir? Jack, I'm an atheist. He goes, that doesn't matter. <laughs> it's like, and you're Jewish. What are you talking about, the choir? <laughs> did, you, um, did you ever gravitate towards uh, to Crumb and Zap comics and the, the, the whole kind of... I, uh, underground comics the, was the last time I was really excited about everything that was going on. I bought every underground comic I could get my hands on. Mm -hmm. I probably have one of the better collections oh, wow. because it, no, I, I have very few things that were re, you know, bought from some another collector. Mm -hmm. They're all, well, and I never let my, I'd buy two copies if I wanted my other would friends you be to read able to them. get those at the shop? Like back then, could you find Zap and those kind of comics? There were headshots. Okay. There were, I'd even buy them. There were people that would sell those in underground newspapers out in front of the zoo. And I became oh, wow. friends with them, and I told them when my dad was going to come out to rouse them for leaving because they really didn't have a permit. They'd give me they'd give me comics if I if I ratted on my dad. I never did tell him that. <laughs> uh, were you into EC Comics and those that kind of world? Yeah, the first or? EC comic I bought was from a, a cartoon or he was an underground comic publisher named Dave Gibson, and it was that one where the guy is going through going through withdrawal while he's, while he's He's, he's like, or, or not withdrawal. He's just shot, shot himself up. But he's like laying on a bed. It's like, mm -hmm. I, I, I thought it was an underground comic at first, of course. Yeah. But I had those paperbacks before then. Oh, okay. So yeah. I knew who EC was. Okay. In fact, John Pound and I would go downtown. There was a bookstore that had some shopping carts chained to the doors out front that would have coverless comics, and they had a ton of ECs mm. for a nickel apiece. Oh, wow. So they were dusty as hell, but we both had like big thick stacks of coverless ECs. Yeah. That'd be great. You know, back then it was so fun to go scrounging because mm -hmm. you didn't know what you were going to find. And I liked science fiction, horror, pulp magazines, monster movies, mm -hmm. um, comic books, toys. I mean, I was like, like the every fan. Rat Fink. Yeah, well, Ratfink especially. <laughs> yeah, Big Daddy Roth. Big Daddy Roth was yeah. another one of my major influences. Yeah, yeah. Um, did I, they ever have any... Was there any proper Big Daddy Roth-sponsored, like, stories? like? Comics? Oh, yeah, no. He There were four <laughs> issues. Pete Millar, who did drag cartoons, he published huh. a Big Daddy Roth comic. Okay. And then there were a bunch of them that were more or less in the underground who style. Owns who owns that? Is, does he have an estate? Because you would think. Oh yeah, no, no. He could go. I I've meant to talk to his his uh, his widow about it, 
Um, he's had, an, uh, I think, three wives mm. and a lot of kids. And there's been a lot of, uh, mm. you know, back and forth going on. But the, the lady who, who uh, uh, he, was, he was married to when he died is Irene Roth, who really is putting out great product. Oh, really? But um, Mary Fleener and I approached her about doing a book that would be all different artists doing their version of Big Daddy Roth type mm -hmm. stuff. And she kind of didn't dig it. Well, she she and Ed were very Ed became very Mormon, mm. so I think you know they like they, even like they they took like images where a monster has like brass knuckles and put a ice cream cone oh, really? in their hand. I don't know. So they kind of sanitize some of them. A little bit, but but you know I mean because that would be a great like one of those big Taskin books you know that has like all the collection that like. Stuart Ing would have or something. Well, it wouldn't be that thick, but the what I really like to see, I used to collect car car craft magazine when I was a kid, because they had full page ads for all the shirt shirts for Big Daddy Roth, mm. and I had no idea who he was. Robert Williams was doing the ad the art in the ads, new cartoons, oh, wow. and the first one was a Tyrannosaurus crashing through a wall while poodles are having a tea party, and. <laughs> And it was like real foreshortened, so you just see this huge head and this tiny body. And I was like, I'm not missing one of these ads. I didn't know that I'd wind up. Well, I, it, I actually have it over there if you can see it. I have a Robert Williams original painting oh, wow. over there. Um, and, you know, he's, a, he's one of my favorites. <laughs> In fact, the painting he did is so offensive that he had women complained about it so much he had to do an answer thing where a female gorilla is ripping a man apart by the crotch so yeah, you, <laughs> um, you like hunter hunter s thompson i see hunter thompson is one of my biggest influences i hate to advocate drugs alcohol violence or insanity to anyone but they've always worked for me yeah. um so let's let's end with a a little like thought um, we, we, you know, the older I get, the more introspective I am, the, the more I kind of think about what is the message that I would want to give to my kids? I don't know if you have, do you have children or not? Oh yeah. He's 31. Yeah. So, you know, what have you learned in this life? Forget the comics and everything, but let's, let's just talk about people. You know, what is the message we'd want to give our kids? Um, What's the big takeaway? Do what you want to do. Do 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 the goal that you think you can't achieve. I mean, you know, it's okay to be obsessive. Not to not to hold everybody out, but don't give up. That's that's what I mean by being obsessive. Do you feel that you I mean, I would look at you and say, here's a guy as a kid loved the Flintstones, loved comics, loved cartoons, actually did that, like worked with his heroes, has all this knowledge and history for decades, 40 years plus, working with his idols and being at their level as far as like, you know, doing these these tasks. Um, did you, do you feel that way? Do you feel like you did what you wanted to do? Absolutely. The problem is there's still lots more I want to do. So I need to stick around for a while. Right. But, you know, two of my best friends are Floyd Norman and Sergio Aragones. And they're both looking damn good and still doing the top-notch work. So, you know, it's not impossible. You're an inspiration because you had a dream and you did it. In this town, you know, there's a lot of people that struggle with doing that right whether it's on camera off camera production acting what have you there's a lot of people entertainment is rough it's hard and a lot of this is what the land of broken dreams or you know whatever oh right? oh it is hard it's hard <laughs> well and, and i'm hearing too it's hard too even when you're doing it it's hard to stay doing it it's hard to get the gigs as jake had said and it's hard to like keep getting work and getting to be able to pay bills and that kind of stuff um, but like you said you don't give up well and I'm very lucky to have a wife that is working her butt off and gets great insurance and 
takes care of things. So, you know, I'm I'm a little feeling a little guilty, but I'm sure glad she's willing to do it because otherwise I I, I don't think I could get any mainstream comic work. Actually I am I am gonna be doing a comic coming up though. And it's kind of mainstream, although the way he runs it, not really. I'm uh, Eric Larson has obviously Savage Dragon. Uh, I really didn't care for it back in the early Image days. It looked like all the other stuff. But Eric has demonstrated to me that he is a real cartoonist. He 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 will try anything, and sometimes it might really hurt him but but I don't care because he I did a spin-off character as a backup character from called little dragon mm. who was kind of like little Archie mm. and he's not he's not connected to him he's kind of a side thing and apparently there was a good enough uh, response that he wants me to do a whole little dragon comic Very cool. and I don't know what savage dragon is paying and I'm not expecting a big landslide but at least I'll have copies to sell when I'm at conventions. And, uh, yeah, because I'm going to introduce a few of my own characters in it. And, and, and Eric's completely hands-off. Yeah. So it will be 100% uh, uh, child-safe, yeah. which... <laughs> okay. Great. Well, thank you so much, Scott. I appreciate your time. It's been wonderful chatting. Well, with thank you. You, yeah. you, you. You asked questions that aren't the usual questions, so I appreciate that.